Hello, everyone. Uh, we'll get started in just a few minutes, uh, roughly about uh, 1 Eastern time. Um, so we can just hang tight. We'll get started soon. Hello. Hi, Hello. how's it going? Doing well, how are you? I can't I'm start my video, Noah. Oh, I'm sorry, hold on, okay. Is that, okay, dang. Um, I can't start my video. Yeah, I'm, I'm fixing it, I'm sorry. Got it, got it, got it. No, you're good. I, I keep forgetting that making you a panelist doesn't mean, try now, sorry about that. No, you're fine. Uh, can I, so, uh, how do you pronounce your name? I don't want to. Serafina. Serafina? Okay. Yes. Cool. Um, all right. Uh, so I'm just going to do like a quick little introduction and then you can take it away. And then at some point we'll, uh, I'll, we'll prompt everybody to ask questions through the Q&A and then I'll try to uh, funnel them toward you whenever you're done. Awesome. Sounds cool. good. Awesome. Let's see. Thank you. 
All right, uh, I think we're ready to go. So hello and welcome to Skype a Scientist Live. My name is Noah Guyberson and I am so, so excited that you're all here to learn about supernovae from our super guest, uh, astrophysicist and science communicator, Serafina uh, Nance. Before I hand it over uh, to Serafina, I'd like to mention that Skype a Scientist is a nonprofit organization that aims to bring science to as many people as possible, as much as humanly possible. If you'd like to support our program, you can do so at patreon.com slash Skype a scientist or at paypal.me slash Skype a scientist. If you have any questions for Serafina, please put them in the Q&A section below. And with that, Serafina, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and your work? Sure, I would love to. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, so I guess I'll just give a little bit of um, background about me and how I got into astronomy and um, very much want to, you know, have this be as interactive as possible. So if you have questions, please feel free to ask me and um, I'm excited to, to answer them. So about me, I um, grew up in Austin, Texas, and I fell in love with astronomy and the stars when I was like four years old. Um, I used to stargaze with my dad every night, and I would listen to Stardate radio with my mom on the way to school. And just from a really early age, I knew that I wanted to devote my life to the stars, basically. So I took an astronomy class in high school, and really fell in love with it and decided to continue that in college where I double majored in physics and astronomy at UT Austin. And um, that's when I fell in love with supernova. So my advisor, my college advisor studied supernova and introduced me to the world of research and to um, sort of these incredible stellar explosions that occur in the night sky. Um, one supernova occurs every second somewhere in our universe. And so um, I got really excited about being able to see and study these events that um, happen all the time and are literally stars exploding. And from st stellar explosions, we can learn some of the most fundamental aspects of our universe, like how fast the universe is expanding and how that is changing with time and what is the composition of our universe. So really these fundamental questions that I thought were fascinating. And um, so while I was at UT, I did research with him. I did a bunch of simulations specifically on the star Betelgeuse to try to determine when it will explode. And um, I also got into science communication. So I worked at the McDonald Observatory um, when I was there, which is basically this huge observatory in West Texas where it's some of the darkest skies in the continental US. And um, we get to actually see the Milky Way galaxy. We get to see our home galaxy stretching out across the night sky. And I got to talk to people about my love for space, which was really a dream. So um, after college, I came to Berkeley to do um, research on supernova. So I work here now as a PhD candidate. Um, I will hopefully be graduating next summer. And um, then the world, the universe is kind of my oyster. We'll see what happens. But I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, to be here and, and share that love of the stars with everyone. That is very, very cool. And uh, I am very excited that you're here with us to share that because I'm sure everyone here has lots and lots of questions um, about cool. stars and astronomy in general, astrophysics. So um, just uh, uh, to remind everyone, if you have any questions for Serafina, please put them in the Q&A uh, below and we'll try to get as many of them asked as possible. Um, Serafina, are you ready for some questions? I'm ready, let's do it. Well, some of the first ones we have are, uh, let's see, uh, what do supernovas look like? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so the cool thing about studying the universe and studying the stars is that we can actually see stars in what's called different wavelengths of light. So in other words, light comes in all different forms. And as astronomers, we use different forms of light to actually understand the objects that we're studying. 
I am lucky in that I work in the visible spectrum, which means I get to use my eyes to actually see what I'm, what I'm studying. And so supernova, you know, to my eye, they literally look like a star, you know, this pin prick of light. And then all of a sudden it goes away and it completely disappears from view. And so we get to try to figure out what that star looked like before it exploded. How big was it? What was its rotation? Was it two stars instead of one star? Um, and try to figure out, you know, all of these different aspects of the stars um, before they exploded, which is cool. Very cool. Uh, we have another supernova question here. Um, and I, lo I love the way this is worded. Uh, a supernova, sorry, a supernova occurs when a star explodes, right? <laughs> yes, that is correct. Yeah, so a supernova is literally a star exploding or two stars exploding sometimes and um, dying. So they leave different things when they explode. Sometimes depending on their mass, they can leave a black hole, they can leave a neutron star, um, they can leave a pulsar. So sort of these like, sci-fi fantasy type words that you know you don't think are actually real but they are they're real yeah. and that's what happens when the star explodes all right so another question about exploding stars uh we have uh, several that basically just want to know why stars explodes uh why star why stars explode and basically what in them is actually doing the exploding yeah um another great question and that's something that's an open research question and that's something that people like me try to figure out every day so we think what happens is that when a star gets massive enough, it can't generate enough power to basically um, counteract the force of gravity. So you have a star, you have gravity that is pulling the star inward, and then you have what's called nuclear fusion in the core. So you have a bunch of elements slamming into each other, generating a pressure to counteract the force of gravity. And what happens is when these stars get big enough, they can't, they succumb to gravity. And so they end up collapsing and then exploding. Let's see. Uh, so, sorry, I had, a, I had a, a phone with this so I could check the layout of the screen and all of a sudden there was audio feedback. I apologize. Um, <laughs> So uh, are there different kinds of supernovas like there are different types of stars? There are different types of supernova. There's a lot of different types, actually. The two biggest types are when you have two stars that sort of rotate around each other and gobble up each other. And sometimes that ignites an explosion. Or you just have one really, really, really massive star that can't fuse any longer and it collapses and then explodes. So what do you mean by can't fuse any longer? Yeah, so stars live by having nuclear fusion in their core. So basically that's the life force of a star is when these elements slam together and then generate light, which streams outward out of the star and then reaches our eyes here on earth and our telescopes here on earth. And so when a star can't get hot enough, to continue to fuse these elements, it basically succumbs to gravity, it collapses, and then it explodes. So how many, how many supernovae have you been able to observe is a great question from that. That, that is a great question. I have observed um, with my telescopes somewhere like around 100 probably. Um, I, yeah, it's really, it's really neat. Um, so I get to monitor stars after they've exploded. Sometimes I'm lucky and I actually discover a new supernova. So that happened about a year ago, which was really cool. Um, but I think, yeah, about, about, about a hundred. That's incredible. I, <laughs> I genuinely was amazed that that number was a hundred. That is truly incredible. Um, it's cool. Uh, to get to discover your own, that's pretty amazing too. What are they named? What are the ones you discovered named? Sadly, the names are like, you know, scientists, especially astronomers, are not very good at naming things. So we have like a bunch of letters and, you know, 
if you <laughs> observe it at January 1st, it starts with an A, and then if it's December 31st, it's a Z. Well, so. All names are a bunch of letters anyway, so. <laughs> That's true. That's right. <laughs> Um, so another great question here. So I'm, I'm trying to group a lot of the ones that are specifically about supernovae, and then uh, we can move on to a new topic when we exhaust those. Um, sure. But when a star explodes, is it gone forever? Is it dead? And then what happens to what it is that it explodes out? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, so when a star explodes, it can completely tear apart the entire part of the star. And so there's nothing left. That can happen. It's rare, but it does happen. Most of the times when a star explodes, it leaves something behind. And that's the core of the star. That's the stuff that had all the nuclear fusion in it. And um, basically that becomes, depending on the mass, either a black hole or a neutron star or a white dwarf. Um, and those are even cooler phenomena that, you know, I sometimes study, but there are many astronomers who devote their, their entire careers to try and understand those objects. There are, so there are three interesting questions here um, about sort of the different, like, almost qualitative aspects of supernovae, uh, where it's, okay. it's one question is, how do you measure the size can super, uh, of supernova? How can supernovae be different colors? Or sorry, how can they be different colors? Uh, and what temperatures are associated with supernovae exploding? Those are all great questions. Um, so th this is actually one of the hardest parts about being an astronomer is that unlike biology or chemistry or even physics, you're not in a lab where you can touch things. You can't, you know, manipulate it with your hands or peer through a, you know, a microscope and adjust it. It's really, you know, we're looking way out there and trying to learn something about something that's so far away that we can't touch, we can't taste, we can't feel. And so that makes astronomy really challenging. And it means that we as astronomers have to be really clever with how we come up with ways to actually find out about these objects. So one of the things we do is we basically point a telescope at, at the star, and then we collect a bunch of light, and then we break that light up into what it, it's different wavelengths. So meaning, um, you know, if you have a prism and you put it in front of a, a light bulb or a light um, source, that prism breaks the light into different colors. And those different colors tell you something about the object. It tells you about the chemical composition, about the temperature, about the mass, about the velocity, about the rotation. So we study different aspects of light in order to figure out some of these fundamental characteristics about our stars. So that's sort of the observational perspective. From a theory perspective, which I also do some theory work, I basically simulate supernova. So I, you know, code a bunch and I try to model some of the characteristics that we see with our telescopes and match them up with my models. So for Betelgeuse, which is this star that I studied in college, and for those who don't know, it's the left shoulder of the constellation Orion. So it's this big red supergiant on um, left shoulder. And um, we basically look at the star and then we run a bunch of models and we try to match up what our models show with the observations of Betelgeuse. So what I find most fascinating about that is that you, you observed supernovae, you've discovered supernovae, and then you transcended the discovery of new ones and just created them in a computer. <laughs> That's a great way to put it. <laughs> That's perfect. So um, uh, let's see, so how do supernovas af affect the universe? Wow, that's a big one. That is, that's another great, I'm liking all of these questions. These are all so wonderful. So supernova are wonderful because they generate these elements within their cores. And then once they explode, they basically dissipate those elements into the surrounding medium, into space. And those elements that are churned up in the cores of stars actually form life. They form, you know, carbon and hydrogen and helium and nitrogen and the stuff that makes up life on Earth. But they also, you know, enrich the interstellar medium, which creates um, different, uh, basically, places for stars to form in the future. They also create 
you know, so they create stellar nurseries, they create these galactic winds. So when a star explodes, it, you know, injects a bunch of stuff into the interstellar medium and that continues going. And so those galactic winds can, you know, create or trigger star formation. They can kick out nearby stars of galaxies into other galaxies. So these stars are kind of traveling along and going between galaxies based on supernova exploding nearby. So they, they really shape the universe as we know it. Wow, that's an incredible. I feel like it is so, supernovae is so often used as like a cataclysmic event that really changes everything in the galaxy and like science fiction. And I never quite understood that because I was like, well, it doesn't just one star explode. There's still millions and millions more, but it sounds like right. it does have a big effect. Yes. Um, so another explosiveness question. Is there anything more explosive than a supernova? So supernova are the most luminous, events in our universe. So they are the brightest explosions that we know of in our universe. That said, if you, so at the centers of galaxies, sometimes there are massive black holes and around those black holes, uh, ma material uh, basically gets sort of sucked into the area around the black hole and that can create these luminous jets and those jets are really bright. Um, there's also, you know, there are different types of explosions that are very bright. Some supernova are brighter than other supernova. And we're still trying to understand those, what we call super luminous supernova. Um, so this is all areas of active research. Very cool. So we've actually had a lot of questions, uh, essentially around the topic of, is there a supernova close enough to earth that we should be worried about it or a star that may go supernova soon. A lot of people seem to be quite concerned. And yeah, now I, yeah. I am too, so please. Totally, <laughs> very reasonable. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I was studying Betelgeuse is that it's, it's actually quite near. It's about 650 light years away, which might seem like it's very far away, but in the cosmic like expanse, it's really quite close. And so, you know, we're trying to determine when it will explode and if it explodes, how will that affect life on Earth? And the good news is that, A, it's probably, well, good and bad news. It's probably not going to explode anytime soon, probably another 100,000 years or so. Um, but when it does explode, it'll get very bright. We'll be able to see it here on Earth, but it won't affect life on Earth. So the radiation won't cause damage. We won't be, you know, at any sort of... Um, in any sort of danger. And that's probably one of the most, um, the closest stars that we are concerned about uh, in terms of exploding. So um, right now we're not uh, particularly concerned about any nearby stars going off, but I will be sure to let you know if we do. Okay, thank you. Thank you for letting us know. <laughs> um, so I think, uh, we may we may come back to supernova. There's so many questions. I, I may have missed some, or there may more more may come in. I just want to note that we have now said Beetlejuice three times, uh, and nothing happens. So I think we're okay if we have any more we're Beetlejuice okay. questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, so moving on to questions like, how long do you plan to remain an astronomer? And maybe you know, how did you decide you wanted to become an astronomer, astrophysicist? Yeah. Um, well, like I said before, you know, I, I fell in love with the stars at a very young age and I thought I have to do something with space, you know, whether it's becoming an astronaut or a researcher or, you know, an aerospace engineer, I, I just have to do something that is associated with space. And so, you know, over the last decade, really, I've, I've been doing research actively and, and I've been an astrophysicist or an astronomer, which for the record are sort of synonymous, um, and I think I will be doing something with space for the rest of my life. In terms of doing, you know, being in academia and being an astrophysicist, I'm not sure. As of right now, I think I will probably go into the space sector more generally um, rather than stay in academia. Um, but I think I'll probably forever be an astrophysicist. Very cool. Well, we're also getting questions. Uh, speaking of, uh, you, you said basically you're going to continue to be in the space space. Uh, we're getting questions about, have you ever gone into space, you know, and would you be interested in going to space? I would love to go into space. I have not yet gone, but I have applied 
Um, so I applied for the NASA astronaut program last year and I applied to go to the moon, I think a couple of days ago, actually. So I am actively trying to go to space as hard as I can. So and there's some great questions about, uh, I like the way this is worded. What do you think is the true joy of being an astronomer? And essentially just more questions about like what your experience is, some of your favorite moments studying stars, um, things like that. Yeah, I love this question. And I think I'm probably gonna take my time with it. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, the most wonderful part about my job and about you know stargazing or having any interaction with the night sky is the perspective that the night sky brings. Um, I love reminding myself of how small we are in the grand expanse of the universe and how, you know, our troubles and our problems and our day-to-day -day struggles are really um, couched in this sort of grander perspective of the cosmos. And that's not to say that our day-to-day -day problems aren't important, but having that perspective helps remind me of um, how sort of my fears and my anxieties um, don't have to dictate my life. And so, you know, there have been many times when I feel very overwhelmed by the physics or the math of what I do. And I step outside, especially if I'm on an observing run, which is what we call when we go to the telescope and, and look, you know, basically look at the night sky. And, um, I remind myself why I'm doing what I'm doing. And it's because I love the stars. I love knowing how small we are and being able to explore. I mean, the universe, we only know 5% of all matter and energy in the universe. The rest is unknown to us. It's in the form of dark energy or dark matter. And we don't know what those things are. And so being able to, you know, be this sort of pioneer and, um, explore is something so beautiful to me. That's really great. I like that sentiment a lot. Um, but it, obviously, these are really uplifting thoughts about how rewarding it is to study space, but maybe getting into the, the sort of more uh, <laughs> difficult day to day yeah. stuff like, for example, how long were you in astronomy class for? <laughs> so I I'm not I... sure if that means one specific very long class <laughs> or like, how long have you been studying astronomy? But yeah, please answer both. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so I've taken astronomy classes uh, every year for the last decade or every semester, I guess. Um, same with physics classes. And it gets, I mean, it's hard. It's a lot of hard work. And, you know, as a woman in science and in, and in physics and in astronomy, and especially as a brown woman, you know, I felt um, really out of place and imposter syndrome has really um, affected me really deeply. Um, and so it's been really tough to sort of tough it out and um, rely on grit to make it through. I think that's probably actually not really the case. I had a lot of really excellent mentorship and I found a community of, you know, other women in astronomy and um, especially people of color in astronomy that uh, have helped me feel um, sort of accepted and like I belong. But, you know, there's a lot of it's there's a lot of challenges um that i have faced in getting into this and that i continue to face every day um but i try really hard to remind myself of why i'm doing it and i'm doing it because i i love it well i think a, a great question here uh, off that is do you have any advice for girls wishing to pursue science in college yes i love this question um I, I mentioned these two things, uh, you know, just now, but I'll, I'll reiterate them. I think finding a mentor is hugely important, someone who can advocate for you um, and open up spaces that maybe don't present themselves um, immediately. I also think finding a community is hugely important. I didn't really have a community in, in undergrad that were in astronomy or physics, and I only found that sort of later on in my career. And I wish I'd had that because I think having that um, sort of support is really, really helpful. And now with social media that, you know, really changes the, the name of the game. I mean, it's far easier to find other people, especially under other underrepresented groups um, in physics and in astronomy now um, than it ever has been before. And I also think, you know, I had a lot of, a lot of professors and a lot of, um, 
people just tell me that I wasn't meant to do this, that I wasn't cut out for it. And that messaging is incredibly harmful. And I think, um, you know, my advice is to just try your hardest not to listen to it if that happens to you, because nobody can tell you what you can and can't do. Um, only you can decide that. And if you're passionate about something, um, I encourage you to go for it. Um, and don't let anybody tell you that you're not good enough because you are. Couldn't agree more. Um, would you be interested in some more sort of science questions? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Me. Um, I, so I, I really like this. Uh, is astronomy just stars or is it more? That's a good question. Astronomy is more. It is everything in our universe. It is planets, it's asteroids, it's comets, it's the sun, it's stars, it's galaxies, and you know, all of these other cool things that make up the universe. It's also, you know, the beginning of the universe, the end of the universe, the composition of the universe. Um, astronomy is everything. <laughs> It sure is. So I mean, really, every everyone's an astronomer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so why, uh, how big is the universe? That's a that's a big question, but a big place. That is a big question. Um, and it's actually kind of hard to answer. So we we measure size of the universe in terms of age. Um, and the reason is because we try to understand everything in the universe based on light and light travels at a finite speed and it crosses a distance in an amount of time. And so based on the distance that it's covered, we can sort of start to understand the scale of the universe. Right now, we, we think that the universe is about 14.3 billion years old, um, which you can start to think about how far light must have traveled in order to get here 14.3 billion years later. Very, very far, I imagine, <laughs> at least relative to our human scale. Yes. <laughs> um, so getting into light, uh, I think a, a good segue would be, can you dive into the mystery of black holes? <laughs> I can try. <laughs> so yeah, so black holes are um, sort of dead stars. They're, they're what happens when a star explodes as a supernova. And light cannot escape from a black hole. So, you know, we, we don't understand really what happens in the center of a black hole because we can't see it. We don't know what goes on. We can see what happens in the sort of what we call um, the disc around the black hole. Um, so basically up until a certain point, a radius away from the center of the black hole, we can see things and we can see things sort of falling in towards this huge mass. And that mass is the singularity of the black hole. But once it goes past that point, it's the point of no return. And we don't know what happens other than things don't come back out. Do you know um, how people are trying to try to answer that question? Like, what are people doing to try to figure out what happens, to, like peer through that? Yeah, I mean, so I'm not a black hole scientist, so I, I can only give sort of my understanding. Um, but I think there's a lot of theoretical work that goes on with black holes. And there's also, and by theoretical work, I mean, there's a lot of modeling and simulations to try to understand how these things form and what they, um, how they interact with other objects nearby. Um, I think there's also a lot of work being done actively on trying to use lensing to find these things. So basically, if you have a galaxy and you have a black hole, the light from the galaxy will be warped around the black hole because the black hole is a mass and it takes up space. And so when something is sort of warped and lensed, we can see that and try to understand the mass of the black hole, the location of the black hole, and other characteristics about it. I, I do appreciate the distinction with the theoretical work because I do a lot of work theoretically, but uh, yeah. this is different. Um, so what a- Totally. <laughs> <laughs> so why do bigger stars burn out faster than tiny stars? That's I, a great question. I'm, uh, that question, I don't know. I didn't know enough to know whether yeah. that was true to begin with. So is that the case? 
Yeah, yeah. So big stars live fast, die young. Um, they really are going through the elements very fast in their nuclear fusion. The reason, is, and again, this is sort of active research, but the reason we think is because the temperatures get so high within these sort of massive stars that they um, are able to fuse elements very fast. And um, because they fuse elements really fast, that means that they reach the point of high temperatures so high that they can no longer fuse elements and then the star explodes. So basically the time scale for a massive star is just shrunk because it's so much bigger and can get so much hotter so much faster. I am sometimes the answers to the questions will work out perfectly. So there's a perfect next couple of questions lined up. Uh, Great. So what elements are in a star? And also uh, here's a question where it, it asks about why iron is the heaviest element a star can fuse. Yeah. That's a complicated question, but I will try my best to answer. Um, so the elements that are in a star, you know, we start with hydrogen and that's sort of the lightest element in the periodic table. And then we get to subsequently heavier and heavier elements as the star fuses. And so you go from hydrogen to helium, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen. Um, and basically you go all the way up to iron. And really the answer is that the star cannot jack up temperatures hot enough to fuse that heavy of an element. And so the star, the stellar core becomes what we say in physics speak is called degenerate, meaning um, the things are so tightly packed together and you can't get hot enough to basically make them uh, take up more space or create heavier elements. And so that's when gravity takes over, the star implodes and then explodes. Is, is there anything in the universe that is hot enough to make iron fuse? Yeah, so when you have these sort of binary star systems, if you have binary neutron stars or binary black holes or a neutron star in a black hole, um, these are the systems that LIGO uh, studies. So sort of these gravitational wave events that have been really, really exciting over the last couple of years have picked up these mergers and in these binary neutron star mergers specifically, you actually get to form the heaviest elements of our universe, gold, um, you know, I, I'm gonna blank on other heavy elements, but they're all formed in those regions. Um, and that's basically all of the heavy elements on earth are formed in those events. So uh, I wanna break up, um a series of many intense sort of nuclear fusion re related questions with, uh, <laughs> do you have a favorite constellation? And is it a separate one? What are the five biggest stars you know? The biggest stars <laughs> I know, oh boy. Um, right, yeah, that's gonna be an embarrassing you, answer. You can do, um, fav you can do five favorite stars if you want. Cool, <laughs> well, my favorite constellation is Orion. Um, I, you know, I studied Betelgeuse for four years in college and a couple years in, in grad school. So that's, that constellation is like printed in my, in my brain. Um, and I love it because you can see it. I mean, you can go outside, you can see Orion and you can see Betelgeuse being really bright and red. Um, over the last year, it had something really exciting happen where it got really faint and we thought maybe it was about to explode. Um, turns out the star just burped and that light from the star was being obscured by the, by the burp. Um, so, you know, I really like Orion in terms of my five favorite stars, you know, this is going to be sort of a lame answer, but I think the sun has to be one of them. Sun is a star and, you know, it, it allows life on earth to exist. Um, Beetle real, real hometown stars. crowd. I know, I know. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's almost a dad joke, but it's not quite there. Um, but yeah, I think Beetlejuice, of course, um, Sirius A and B are really cool. Um, I think all of the stars in the Big Dipper are cool. Um, yeah, stars that I can see and I can actually, you know, look at it with a telescope and say, I know you. <laughs> well, st <laughs> speaking of stars you can see and roping back in supernova again, um, there's a great question here about, uh, is a supernova the biggest explosion that humans have ever seen with their own two eyes, I guess. But also, I, I think uh, there's some more questions about here. Uh, like, what is the biggest supernova explosion that humans have ever witnessed, like, on Earth? Like, have we ever, yeah. could we just look up and be like, wow, that was really bright? 
Totally. So in, let's see, oh, I'm going to get the date wrong. I think 1453 or 1400s or 1500s, there were two stars that exploded that we could see here on Earth. Um, one of them is Kepler's supernova and one of them is um, Brahe's supernova. Um, and, you know, we could literally see it in different parts of the Earth and it lit up the night sky and it was around for a few weeks to a few months. Um, just like when Betelgeuse explodes, it basically shines as bright as the moon. Um, so we have a second moon in our sky for a couple of months, which is really neat. Um, yeah, so there's, you know, there's really interesting actually cultural um, records of these supernova. There are, um, there's basically like petroglyphs of basically a hand and then the moon and then a star and the hand is there to show scale and it shows the crescent moon and then it shows the star that exploded, which is really neat. So, you so know, it, humans have kept records of this for, for centuries. So it looked, so you're saying it wasn't just like a pinpoint that was bright enough. It looked similar in size to the moon. Yes. That's wild. I did not realize that. That yeah. is very yeah. crazy. Um, well, here's a question uh, sort of zooming out again uh, about the expansion of the universe. Will the universe ever stop expanding? And what will happen to the Milky Way? Will it ever go away? The Milky Way galaxy. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's also an area of active research. As of right now, we know that this stuff called dark energy is in our universe. And it basically is an invisible force that propels the expansion of the universe. And the expansion gets greater and greater with time. So meaning it's accelerating. And based on that, it means that our universe will continue to accelerate forever and we will be plunged into sort of infinite darkness because the distance between stars will be so far that we'll be plunged into darkness. Um, that means that the Milky Way will be sort of taken apart um, as the universe continues to expand. But, you know, this is on the order of billions and billions and billions of years from now. So not something we should be worrying about imminently. No. <laughs> so I've got, uh, speaking of uh, imminent explosions, um, the, there's a few questions here that are noting that recently there was some uh, excitement about Betelgeuse potentially exploding uh, soon or, uh, and people asking about, uh, this actually question from Robert Frawley here, didn't Betelgeuse fl flicker this year? What was that and what happened to planets and stars around it? And I just wanna know that Robert Frawley uh, is a uh, person who works at BioBus, which is an organization that teaches science to kids. And so I have a feeling this cool. question is going to get uh, worked into uh, the the curriculum uh, for Rob there. So help cool. Rob out. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I would, lo I would love to help out. Um, so yeah, so Betelgeuse flickered. It basically got much dimmer very fast and continued to dim. And then all of a sudden it started brightening again. And so there were lots of questions being thrown around as to whether that dimming was a harbinger of an explosion. And really the answer is no. What we think happened is that Betelgeuse has a bunch of turbulence as it gets older. And so these massive stars, that's very, very common. There's matter being thrown off, it's rotating really fast, there's convection within the interior of the star, and Betelgeuse, what we think happened, burped up a bunch of matter, it expelled some matter, and that matter literally um, blocked some of the light that Betelgeuse was emitting from actually reaching our eyes. And so it looked, you know, very physically dimmer to us, but then once that light, um, actually made it through the cloud of dust and that cloud sort of dissipated or, you know, went into the interstellar medium, um, we were able to see the light again and saw that it was, you know, happy and healthy and just, you know, still chugging along. <laughs> so we think that it, you know, still probably has another hundred thousand years or so before it explodes. Darn. I know. <laughs> um, here's a, a question that truly I, my brain is not quite big enough to comprehend. Um, so this question not only asks, are there supernovae in other galaxies, but are there supernovae in other universes? Are there other universes? Ooh, 
Yeah, this is a good question. Um, you know, all of this is very theoretical. We talk about the concept of multiverses as being an option. Um, one of my favorite theories is sort of this soap bubble theory where, you know, we have a bunch of soap bubbles that are representative of universes and sometimes they touch. And so if you ever experienced deja vu, it could be that your, <laughs> your soap bubble is touching another soap bubble. I think it's probably unlikely, but you know, there are a lot of, a lot of theories out there. Um, but yeah, I mean, theoretically, if you have another universe that, you know, has massive stars that could explode a supernova, we really, we have no idea. It's really the answer. I, I could have sworn I've heard that answer before. Um, or maybe it's a soap bubble touching another one. But uh, so, so um, can a star's energy be restored once it has died out? And there are a few other questions that have to do with like, uh, that ask, they use the term like a cycle of, of stars exploding and then uh, using the word reforming. So what, is there some sort of like stellar explosion and reforming cycle or is it just once it explodes, it's gone? Yeah, um, so a star can um, explode and then reignite fusion on its surface. And that happens if you have another star nearby. So if you have a sort of this binary system and a star explodes, leaves a white dwarf. Well, if the sort of companion star accretes matter, me meaning shares matter onto the surface of that star, sometimes it can get hot enough to sort of ignite fusion and potentially fuel for a quite a bit of time longer and then explode again. So the sort of dynamics at play when you have other stars in the picture is really interesting and again is an active area of research. Oh, this is a great one. So there's, uh, of course, there's been uh, a lot of interest in your uh, application to go to the moon and uh, desire oh, yeah. to go to space. So this is a really cool one. Um, so let's say astronauts are able to someday we're able to travel in space and like go, you know, Star Trek style, go study a supernova. What are the safety precautions that you would have to have for astronauts to be able to like be close enough to a supernova to like study it there? That's a good question. I haven't really thought about that. I think, you know, you would need to be far enough away that you wouldn't be, you know, in the blast radius of the star when it explodes. You know, it's, it's basically a bomb in space. It's a stellar sized bomb. So you need to be far enough away that you're not going to get blown up. Um, you need to be, you know, shielded from any sort of radiation that the star emits. Um, you might get like, sped out you might be like ejected from the area around the star because of these hyper velocity winds that occur around the star so i think it would be a pretty difficult place to be as an astronaut but like who knows what sort of technology we have in the future maybe it's possible so say you're an astronaut who's interested in setting a big star you think is going to go supernova soon um we have a few questions here about like what do stars do so we, we mentioned the, the possible dimming of Betelgeuse and how it wasn't actually indicating that it was going supernova soon. Um, but what are some things that a star might do differently that would let you know in advance uh, that a star is about to explode so that you as the astronaut observing that supernova can start to back away very quickly? Great question. Yeah, that's a great question. And that's, that's basically what I study. I mean, a lot of this is trying to understand those last few hundred years before a star explodes and it's it's really difficult to understand that there's um basically so much happening on the interior of the star it's so chaotic there's this convection and turbulence and i mean the star is rotating and basically thrusting off matter like indiscriminately as it goes so you know when a star gets to that chaotic period you know it's about to blow up soon so you wouldn't want to be anywhere nearby um so here's a i don't, I don't want to put you on the spot or anything maybe we'll i'll ask this and then we'll go to another one if you need time but do you have a favorite joke about space or stars and if the answer is no that's fine but we can also like ask oh, another one and see if it I, comes through later. I have one, but I can't remember. I, I have a favorite, I have a favorite science joke. Sure. I laugh every time. Okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. It's so, dangerous to pre pre preface it. I know, that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, All right, so the joke is a neutron walks into a bar and he goes up to the, to the bartender and asks for, you know, a, a drink, a water. And, and, you know, the bartender gives it to, to the neutron and the neutron goes, all right, how much do I owe you? And the bartender goes, for you, no charge. 
<laughs> that is good. Uh, that's, that's great. That's very good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for indulging me with laughter. I appreciate it. <laughs> um. I know um, it's so bad it's good that's really the only way to put it um so then you know is there a positron also at the bar that says really no no charge exactly. one? and he says yeah I'm positive <laughs> nailed it <laughs> so I'm gonna just shuffle right along um so here's a question about how has the COVID pandemic affected um astronomy um and I guess your ability to collect data and stuff like that yeah the cool thing about being an astronomer, especially nowadays, is that everything I do is on my computer. Um, so, you know, when I observe at a telescope, I'm actually not looking through the telescope with my eye. I am hooking my computer up to the telescope and then the telescope is collecting data and I'm just, you know, analyzing the data on my laptop. So really that work can be done pretty much anywhere. What has been affected is basically the telescope support staff, the, the astronomer on site who helps basically make sure that you're not breaking the telescope um, and the telescope operator, like those people could not be on site. And so a lot of telescopes were closed for an amount of time during COVID. Um, that has reopened back up to some extent, but it's still um, sort of in between. Gotcha. Um, so getting back to this, this question of the universe expanding. Um, we have a great question here. What is it expanding into? Yeah, that's a good question. And the answer is it's not expanding into anything. Um, yeah, so uh, <laughs> it's really, really hard to, to understand and picture. But I think, you know, when we talk about the universe expanding, we're basically talking about how the distance between objects in the universe is getting greater with time. But we can only speak with any specificity about the observable universe, which is the universe that emits light that we can basically see. But beyond that, there is still stuff. We just haven't been able to see that light because it's so far away that it hasn't reached our eyes yet. So there is this, you know, beyond the observable universe that is still stuff. It's still universe. We just can't see it yet. Um, <laughs> I like this. What is the smallest star, you know? Or what is the smallest like possible star? What are like the limits on, what is the lower yeah. limit on a star's size, if there is one? Yeah, this is actually, I mean, this is a, it's a good question. It's a hard question. Um, there are what we call failed stars. So Jupiter is actually, you know, sort of on that brink of it's almost massive enough to be a star and start fusing within its core, but it's actually not quite there. Um, so these failed stars are called brown dwarfs um, and they basically are littered throughout the universe and they're just not quite big enough to um, be able to fuse. I think the mass limit for that is about uh, sixty percent of the size of our sun, the mass of our sun. Um, but you know, if it's below that, it just can't get hot enough to start fusing and actually emit light. So, I so Jupiter is sorry. Did you say Jupiter? Yeah. Or, so, how much? Like, what would happen if <laughs> Jupiter some like enough asteroids hit Jupiter? It now has enough mass. What would happen to our solar system? And yeah. To the if it just uh, like, flickered on one day. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, something, it wouldn't be like asteroids hitting it. It would have to be that it accretes mass from like a nearby object. But if that, I mean, if that happened, we would have another, another sun basically. So we would be a two star system, um, which, you know, would affect, would nearby planets be burnt up? Would we be consumed in these stars? Um, it would throw off the orbits of the solar system and the planets within it. So yeah, it would be, it would be really interesting to model that. Well, we're getting uh, toward the end of this Skype Scientist Live uh, and there are 
hundreds of questions here for you. Um, I so sorry if I can't I can't get to them all. Is there any uh, resources or things that you've done online uh, or where they can maybe contact you to ask questions or things you've done that maybe answer some of the big questions people have asked you in the past? Yeah, definitely. Um, so two things. One is um, I host an astronomy show called Constellations, and it's on all streaming platforms on Seeker. So it's on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and we basically talk about some of the most mind-blowing parts of astronomy and the cultural implications of those sort of things. So that's really exciting. Highly recommend you check it out. Um, we have four more episodes coming out this season. So we're just sort of in the middle of the season. Um, and the other thing is I just wrote a children's book about astronomy that is available for pre-order starting yesterday. So that's really exciting. Um, it's called Little Leonardo's Fascinating World of Astronomy. And I really like it both because I get to write about astronomy and, you know, I also pushed really hard to have representation be a really big aspect of this book. So, you know, seeing yourself as an astronomer, I think is just as important as learning the facts about astronomy. Um, and I really hope that this book brings that to, to people. So um, you can buy it anywhere online by the end of the week. Right now it's on Gibbs Smith as the publisher and it's on their website right now. Um, but by the end of the week, all places you buy your books, it'll be available. Um, and then if you have questions directly for me, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at starstrickensf. Um, and I will do my best to answer questions, but hopefully those resources will be helpful. Amazing. Thank you so much. Can you can you one more time tell us the name of the book for those? Because I'm yes. certainly going to go get it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I hope, yeah totally. I hope everyone well, here will too. <laughs> yeah, me, me too. Um, <laughs> it's called Little Leonardo's Fascinating World of Astronomy, or Little Leo for short. Um, so yeah, if you just look that up, you'll find it. Amazing. That's so exciting. So, um, you know, Sarah, the executive director of Sky the Scientist, couldn't be here today. That's why I'm here. But Sarah likes to wrap these up by with two last questions. Um, and they are, and I'll tell you both of them now so you can plan your uh, answer accordingly. Cool. You have everyone's attention in the world and you can tell them one thing about supernovae. What is it? That's number one. And number two, you still have everyone's attention in the entire world. <laughs> and you can tell them one thing about literally anything. It can be as big and important or as silly and small as you like. What would that be? I think the first thing about supernova, the most important thing, the most profound thing to me is that we are star stuff. Everything that you see, touch, feel, kiss, breathe is the stuff of stars. And that is churned up in the cores of these massive stars that explode as supernova. Um, so, you know, by, by studying supernova, we study us. Um, there is sort of this human connection to the stars that I think is so literal and profound. Um, so that's my first answer. The second answer is harder, I think. Um, you know, if I were to tell anybody anything on earth, um, I would probably say to look up at the night sky as much as you can. Um, I think there's nothing more calming or beautiful or expansive um, that can really help us understand our place in the universe. Um, so that would be my advice. Amazing. Um, but, so that was the one about anything? Yes. Okay, good, good. Okay, we're all set. We've covered all the bases. Cool. Now we know everything there is to know about supernovae. And I hope everyone is super excited to go not only learn more things we already know, but become supernovae scientists and discover new things. You can, uh, as we learned today, see supernovae that have already been discovered and study them. You can discover new ones. You can even create supernovae in a computer uh, and learn <laughs> lots of cool stuff about our universe and the stars that populate it. Um, before we go, thank you so much, Serafina, and also to our interpreter, Aaron. Thank you so much. Um, if you enjoyed this experience, experience and you would like to support our programs and efforts to put on events like this one, you can do so at patreon.com slash Skype a scientist or at paypal.me slash Skype a scientist. And with that, please have everyone, everyone have a great day. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Bye. Thank you so much, Noah. And thank you, Aaron. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us. And this is a really, really great, uh, really great job. <laughs> Yay, thank All you. Right. All have right. a great day, y'all. Bye. Bye.